Open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 1. We'll begin at uh, verse 24. And this is brutal sarcasm. Uh, unbeknownst to many Christians, the Lord can be, has been, will be again, brutally sarcastic in his uh, pronouncements, in his dealings sometimes with us even. Uh, the Lord has uh, an ability to uh, put forth sarcasm, and, and more often than not, it goes over the heads of believers. I'll try and explain that a little bit, but also with the sarcasm, uh, the sarcasm has caused many Jews, believe it or not, if you read the history of the putting together of the Old Testament, a lot of Jews had problems with some of the books, like Ezekiel and certain passages. They were so brutally negative, so hard against the Jews that it was hard for the Jews to, to read that and inc include that in the script. They had no choice. It was from God. They, they knew it was from God, but it just was so punishing to read the things that God was saying about them. And look, in the New Testament, we don't escape that. You, you look at the letter to the Laodiceans, and he, he says, you're blind, you're naked, you're miserable, uh, I'll spew that, I'll spit you out of my mouth. I'll say, I mean, what is that? What is that? You see, p people are getting uh, so much of what I call a, another Jesus, what Paul called another Jesus. The biblical Jesus is fading away. He, he's... He, he's becoming more and more distant from the, from, from the Christians. They're, and Christians, without realizing it, are fashioning a God after their own image, in their own mind, and how he should speak and act and what his reactions should be to our problems or whatever. It's, it's dangerous to think that way. If you don't keep your mind and your eyes on the Word of God, you, you're you going to swallow that stuff. You're going to be in trouble. Now, when I first read this years ago in Proverbs chapter 1, this portion of the of this chapter, I, 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 it was, I had to go over it again and again and say, wow, this is God. This is God. my Jesus. This is the Holy Spirit. This is God saying this to his people. Look, starting with verse 24. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. Now look at this 26. C can you believe this about the God who loves you? I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. Y you want to look at that again? Is this the Jesus that you have in your mind right now, laughing at, at, looking at you, making a mess of your life and getting into more trouble than you ever dreamed could come your way, and he's looking down and laughing, <laughs> laughing at you because you put aside his word and you decided to do things your way. I said, God wouldn't do that. Yes, he would. You see, this is so unbelievable to many Christians. Just see, we, so, his ways are not your ways. <coughs> his thoughts are not our thoughts. He has a, a hatred for sin and evil and wrongdoing that you know nothing about because of our sin-polluted natures and the corruptions of our minds because of sin. We can't grasp this. Therefore, when we read a verse like this, it's, it's shocking Listen, you, let me know when you go to ch church on Sunday and you're going to hear a sermon on this. Okay, let, let me know. Let, let me know who's going to preach this. Look at verse 27. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Why? For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Does that sound like a loving God to you? God is love. Jesus loves me. Yes, I know. Verse 30. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. When the Lord attempted to reprove you, correct you, whatever, you despised it. 
You, you didn't just say not now. You, you brushed it off with, ah, I know what I'm doing. Or I, I've got this thing figured out. Oh, you do? You do, huh? That's why the Lord's going to laugh at you when disaster strikes. <laughs> you had it figured out. You see, God doesn't think much of our opinions, okay? That's why he says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not to thine own understanding. Your understanding, my understanding has been polluted by sin. You've got to go by what the word says and you've got to ask the Holy Spirit to show you what the meaning of the word is and how best to apply it in every situation that you find yourself in. That's how you walk with the Lord and you fear him. They're in trouble because they what? It says they did not choose the fear of the Lord. They hated knowledge. They didn't choose the fear of the Lord. Therefore, what? Verse 31. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way. You know how many people started off right with the Lord and are in a mess today? They're in a mess today. And uh, they're eating right here, the, the fruit of their own way. Not the Lord's way. They chose their own way. They chose their own. And what happened to them? They lost their eyesight. They can't discern anymore. They can't see spiritual things. That's why he, the, the, the Holy Spirit uh, told John to write to the Laodiceans. Here, you're, you're naked and miserable and blind. And then what? Anoint your eyes with eye salve. That's the Holy Spirit. Clean out the pus that's in your eyes because you can't see straight. How's that? Is that nice speech? Is that, is that comforting to hear? You say, no, Brother Militello, and you keep putting the emphasis on this stuff. Yeah, because we're to fear God. We're to fear God. That makes us walk with God. And that makes us love him. You can't, maybe you have trouble understanding that. Fear. It leads to love and more love and more love because you find that as you fear the Lord, he's more and more gracious to you, more and more tender, more and more giving, and closer to you than you could ever have hoped for because you're walking in the fear of the Lord. When you're not and you treat the things of God lightly, then your mind has to invent another Jesus. So you pick up these little mantras, God loves me and all of that stuff, and you comfort yourself with that stuff. I understand that's human nature. So he says, therefore, shall they eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. That's scary. Turn to John, uh, Jeremiah 7, verse 16, as a, uh, a match meet for that. Jeremiah 7, verse 16 says, uh, he's telling Jeremiah, Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them. If my people that are called by my name, here we go, and you know, they humble themselves and repent and I'll heal them and their land and everything. Uh, listen, uh, get off uh, th this idea that we're going to recover spiritually in this country. It's not going to happen. Okay, you pray all you want for revival. It's not coming. And you can pray all you want for healing our land. That's not happening. I, yeah, I thank God for our government and the freedoms we have here. Thank God for that. But healing this land spiritually? No. He says in verse 16, Jeremiah 7, Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me. For what? For I will not hear thee. You say, it's always good to pray, Brother Militell. Yeah, when the Lord shows you to, when he leads you to, sure. I, I, yeah, it's good to pray. Pray for your enemies. Pray. But there are times when the Lord says, stop praying. Stop, forget this. This is not going to change. This is, I, I've cut them off. You, you say, is that there are Christians right now who have been cut off and might not even know it. Where God is not going to deal with them. He's just going to leave them wallow in their own filth. And nobody's going to come and try and correct them and deal with them and strive with them. He says in Genesis, my spirit shall not always strive with man. And that includes his own people. It comes a time when the Lord, listen, he pulled away from the Jews. He had told them they couldn't believe Jeremiah. They wouldn't believe Jeremiah. They kept telling Jeremiah, it's not going to happen. We have the temple here. This is Jerusalem. This is where our fathers, David and Solomon. No, it's not going to happen. You keep saying uh, God is going to cut us off. He's going to deliver us over to our enemies. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. No, you're nuts. And they put him in jail. What? Hate speech. Hate speech. 
hate speech. He, didn't, he, he wasn't for the well-being of the people. You see, they, they couldn't believe that would happen. And it's Christians that don't believe it would happen. They say, I can never be forsaken. That's true. I shall never leave you nor forsake you. That doesn't mean he's going to fellowship with you. That doesn't mean he's going to walk with you and point out the way. No. Why, why do you get that idea? There's a lot of Christians out that haven't heard from God in years and won't until they go up in his presence, literally. That's pretty sad. You say, why? Did the Lord stop walking with them? No, they stopped. They took another direction, like the book of Judges, where it ends in the last verse, in the last chapter, and everyone did that which was right in their own sight. They all went their own way. They all decided they knew better than God how to conduct their life and their affairs. And this is becoming a real problem. Notice every letter that was sent out to the seven churches in Revelation 1, 2, and 3 all end up with, uh, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Imagine that. There's not only a, a, a visual problem where they're blind and they can't discern anything, there's a hearing problem. They're not hearing the things God wants them to hear. The rebukes, the corrections, the warnings, the things that God shows you where, hey, this needs to be changed. This needs to be dealt with. They don't want to hear it. Many of God's people have turned off to that. They'd rather go to the computer and sign in on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever garbage that they want to sign in on and, and get comforted by how many likes do I have today? Who likes me? Who doesn't like me? Who's up? I mean, something is really wrong. If, if, if you got to resort to that, that's pretty pathetic. And don't tell me you use it for the Lord and everything, please, okay? Don't tell me you use it for the Lord. Yeah, Brother Botello, I witness on there and I deal with people and everything. Congratulations. Congratulations. Get, get, you can put your face in the real book. Forget, forget Facebook, uh, face, Facebook with Mark Zuckerberg there, who wants everybody connected. He said, Mark Zuckerberg is a perfect tool of the devil. He's bringing the world together. He wants everyone connected. But he's in trouble now, Mr. Zuckerberg. He's got a little problem there with the U.S. Congress. Things are not going well. It turns out that Facebook has uh, uh, given their information about everybody that subscribes uh, to them, uh, to, to the highest bidder. They, you know, this thing about security and confidentiality and privacy, if you believe that, I have a bridge in Brooklyn I'd like to sell you, okay? I mean, it, it, is anybody that naive to trust the, these companies uh, to, to guard your privacy, or even the government for that matter, to guard your privacy? Come on, will you? The minute you sign on to these things and give out your numbers or bank account numbers or social security numbers, address, age, your likes, what you like, what you didn't like, what school you graduated from or whatever, it, it goes everywhere. It's in the public domain. Okay, look that up. The public domain, privacy, my foot. I learned about privacy and confidentiality very early on in government, in local government, when I worked in the mayor's office in New York City. I had a, a hearing, a situation with the boss where I had to straighten him out, and I brought a charge against him, and he was to be blamed. I brought a charge against him, and there was a hearing, and I was told uh, at this hearing where two or three officers sat down and heard my side of it, uh, that it was all in strict confidence. It was between me and these I forget it was two or three individuals. And I said, all right. I, you know, I was, I was kind of naive then. <laughs> I believed it. I think I said this on the air before. I no sooner got back to my office, it couldn't have been five or ten minutes at the most that the phone was ringing. And there's my boss, who I just took, took to the cleanest in my deposition, <laughs> telling me, how could you say that about me? I said, how did you know what I said? How is it you know what I said or did not say? Oh, don't worry about it. The walls have ears. I says, oh, yeah? And I grabbed those two or three officers later on, and I said, you know, I could make it really bad for you, but I really don't care. The boss heard it. He had what I had to say. Fine. Let him live with it. Too bad. He doesn't like it. Let him lump it. He can't fire me. I'm a permanent civil servant. 
And as for you people, I'll never again ever fall for this idea of confidentiality. There's more gossip going on over here than, than a bunch of Jewish women sitting there down by the pool at Brighton Beach talking about what everybody's doing or not doing, okay? So, <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I, it's because of the things that have shaped me in life that I have the attitude that I have. I am charitable. I love God's people. I'm willing to walk the extra mile with them when they're gracious and they're tender and eager to, to have the truth and walk with the truth, and their heart shows it. Uh, but with others, and I sense that rebellion or that ego pop up and that, you know, I'm going to do it my way or whatever, well, then I'm, I, I'm just not a nice person to deal with, I guess. I, I, I guess... <laughs> I'll have to apologize to the Lord when I see him at the judgment seat of Christ. But there you go. Until, th until that happens, I'm going to continue putting it out the way I put it out. And if you can't deal with it, what can I say? Get a bag of popcorn, turn on the Disney Channel, and enjoy yourself. Amen? Amen. Open your Bibles to Luke's Gospel. And we're going to be in chapter 17. And I'm going to talk about the conditions now, business as usual, prior to the coming of the Lord. The conditions we're experiencing here on this earth, where we've had earthquakes and famines in diverse places and all of that stuff, and wars and rumors of war, and that's going to go on, until, and the Lord made it plain that it would. Doesn't mean the end is near, it, but... It, it it's always gone on now, and, and we need to look for something else. What will the conditions really be like? Well, Luke's gospel gives the best description. It lets us know here in chapter 17, beginning with verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Well, the days of Noah were corruption. You had the fallen angels that had mated with earthly women. And violence filled the earth. And there was corruption. Uh, all flesh had corrupted itself on the face of the earth, except Noah and his family. They, they were found righteous. God spared them. But everything else was corrupt. Now, Paul talks about this corruption when he writes Timothy... In 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, he makes it plain, beginning in the first verse, uh, in the last days perilous times shall come. Well, that's the way it was in Noah's day. It was scary. There was violence all over. And we live now in a society that's becoming more and more perverse and violent, and violent. Uh, terrorism in the last uh, decade has really caught everyone's attention. People are willing to blow themselves up. Uh, in order to put their political points across or their religious viewpoints. That's insanity, but that's the world in which we live. You say that it never happened before. Well, not really. It kind of did. You ever hear the kamikaze pilots? Japan, World War II? They killed themselves because they were in love with the emperor and they had taken a vow to the emperor and they killed themselves in order to preserve Japan. And that's gone on in history. But who was the first suicide bomber? I had a palace that was it an Arab once in New York City. I mentioned this to him. I said, the Jews are first in everything, salvation and knowledge. He looked at me. I said, and they were even first in suicide bombers. He said, what? I said, did you ever hear Samson? Do you have his story in the Koran? He looked at me. He didn't know what I was saying. I said, Samson. He blew himself up. And he brought the house down. He killed all those Philistines with him, Arabs, Philistines. He took them all down by blowing himself up, by destroying himself. He didn't blow himself up, but he was a suicide bomber. He looked at me. I said, see, the Jews beat you in everything. <laughs> he got more done with that, that act than, than your stupid suicide bombers that blow themselves up with a bomb attached to them. Well, be that as it may, but as it was in the days of Noah... So shall it be in the day of the Son of Man. So what you have in the last days of the church is a 
uh, a collapse of character, just a spreading corruption. It's not always visible. It's not visible, but I, I see it in many ways, like termite damage. Out, outwardly doesn't look like much. Then you put your hand through the wall and it just falls apart. The wall falls apart. And I got to tell you, our government, uh, our politics has become more and more corrupt. And not just on the Washington, D.C. level, but the state level. And unfortunately, very much in the local level as to who gets contracts and who gets favoritism. And it's just getting corrupt. It's sad. It's sad. But when you lose the fear of God, that's what happens in a society. And America had been blessed for so long with the fear of God, with the fear of God. When Irving Berlin uh, made up that song, wrote that song, God Bless America, it, it was a time when America was blessed because there was the fear of God. And he wanted it to continue. And that's why he wrote, God Bless America. Uh, by the way, there was talk about that adopting that song as the nation's national anthem to replace our uh, Star Spangled Banner, which a lot of people had problems with, especially remembering the words. <laughs> uh, but the talk of using God Bless America was uh, scotched. And the reason for that was Irving Berlin was a Jew. And the people who run this nation didn't want a Jew, uh, uh, what a Jew wrote, replacing our national anthem, Okay. So is there anti-Semitism still rampant? Yeah, yes, there is. Yes, there is. But it's undercover. It only pops its head when something like this issue comes along. Isn't that something? I told that to somebody in church. I said, Brother Milton, I never knew that. I said, sure. That was in the days of Franklin Roosevelt when he had just been elected president uh, not long after that. And there was a movement. To replace the Star Spangled Banner with God Bless America, land that I love. But when everyone found out it was written by a Jew, that was the end of the movement. It suddenly came to a halt. <laughs> I like telling people this. First of all, people are so uninformed today, it's pathetic, you know. It's sad. It's really sad. So when they get, they get a little tidbit of knowledge, they say, wow, I never knew that. Well, sure you never knew it. You're on stupid Facebook all the time. I, you're not learning anything. All right, let's get back to this. It says in verse 27, here it is, business as usual. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Well, I want to stick with this a while. They married wives. Now, biblical marriage is flesh joining flesh. I think you know you should know that. I'm not talking about a state-sanctioned marriage or necessarily a church-sanctioned marriage. I'm talking about biblical marriage, flesh joining flesh, and the two become one, one, uh, one, one person. They married wives. They, the people of the earth, married wives. You could also mentioned here that I could also think about these fallen angels who, who were uh, cohabitating with the daughters of men. And then it says, they were given in marriage. Yeah, have you ever read about the this, this sex slave traffic that's going on today? You have any idea what's going on in places like Asia and India where parents give up their daughters? They were given in marriage. Here, and who are their daughters? prostitute them. You know what? You, you, this is not talked about much. This is a growing problem. And women and, and girls being captured and kidnapped as sex slaves. So they married wives. They were given in marriage. So there was a lot of cohabitating going on. Now, we had the sexual revolution, so-called, back in the 60s, when the birth control pill came out. So the idea of marrying and cohabitating and became, you see, this is how you know it's the last days. It says as it was in the days of Noah. Well, it was probably all of this stuff going on. It must have been rampant fornication, rampant. Well, now you have it today. A nice little statistic that came out not long ago was the tremendous rise in sexually transmitted diseases, STDs, that no one wants to talk about. But it's a real epidemic in this country. And a new form of syphilis or gonorrhea, which, is, which can hardly be detected, is really infecting people. 
And here it is. They were they married wives. They were given in marriage. Well, there it is. This is as it was in the days of Noah. What? So shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. We're, we're right here. We, we know it soon. And then what? Until the day that Noah entered the ark. But then, he, then he brings out Lot. Likewise also in verse 28, as it was in the days of Lot. Again he repeats, they did eat and they drank. There's no famine here. Nobody's starving in America or shouldn't be. Drinking? Wow. Soft drink sales have gone down, but on the other hand, bottled water is, all kinds of new drinks have come out. Light beer and all of that stuff make drinking uh, alcohol more attractive. They did eat, they, they drank. Now here's the business as usual. They bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. That's life as usual. They bought, they sold. They went to flea markets and garage sales. What do you think that is? Commerce, buying and selling, trading, collecting. They bought, they sold. They planted, and they built it. They built it. Like when the towers went down in New York, where I used to work just two blocks away. They put up a new one. It took them a while, but they put up a new one. They built it. They plant, and they build. In other words, society today, for the most part, takes no heed of what the scripture says about the sudden return of your Savior, Jesus Christ. You're a born-again Christian. You know the scriptures. You know what the world does not know or what they refuse to know. Willful ignorance. You know it. You see it coming. You're living in the last days. What is your excuse for not going all out for the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that the time is just about up? You're lucky. We have today. No, there's no luck involved. We have today by the grace of God. We might have tomorrow by the grace of God, but we can't be sure. Why? Because he can come tonight. As a thief cometh in the night, suddenly, without warning, the conditions are there. Paul talks about a woman in travail in 1 Thessalonians 5. He uses that example about a woman to give birth, but you know when a woman is ready. You see how large she becomes. She's carrying you can kind of tell, wow, she's pretty close to her due date. Well, can't you see? The, the, these scriptures all show us, if you study them carefully, that we're not in darkness, that that day should overtake us as a thief, like the world. We're not in darkness. We know. We know. Aha, when it happens, you say, I'm not surprised. I kind of expected the Lord. In fact, I kind of thought he was late. He tarried a little giving us Christians who are not serving him properly or wholeheartedly enough time, a little more time, to earn rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. And I've told that to Christians, as I've mentioned on other broadcasts, very plainly said, it's good for you that the Lord hasn't come yet because you're in trouble and you're not ready. I wish and I pray he comes tonight. In fact, right now. Let him come now. Amen. I'm ready. I want to go. This world holds no attraction for me. I'm not interested in other things. <coughs> Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. But there's a lot of Christians that are not ready at all. And yet they talk about, oh, the Lord is coming. Yeah, praise the Lord. I hope he comes and everything. No, no. For many of you, don't, don't be saying that because you don't know what you're talking about. You're certainly not in position to meet the Lord. So, what a condition is going to be? Well, look around. As it was in the days of Lot, you've got the rise of the Sodomites. That's obvious. You don't have to be well informed to see that. And not that there's many, many more of them, but they're out there. They're out of the closet. They're making themselves known now. In my day, you didn't dare come out of the closet. You didn't go around and advertise your sin. You were ashamed of it because you knew it was wrong. Not today. Now they celebrate your sin. Now you have parades. <laughs> now you have parades. And anybody who talks against your sin is accused of being bigoted or having a heart full of hate. Well, you're a bigot, Militello. You're a bigot. I am. Why? Oh, well, because you don't recognize marriage equality. Marriage equality. What are you talking about? Marriage equality. Well, when two people love each other, be they two males or two females, whatever, they ought to get, they should be allowed to get married. That's marriage equality. I said, really? What if a father loves his daughter? Should they get married? 
What if a mother loves the son? Should they get married? What if you love your dog? Should you marry your dog? I mean, how stupid is this? Just because you say they love each other, they want to get married, that's a sanctioned marriage. That's a legitimate marriage in your eyes. It's a joke. But that's the age in which we live. So he puts Lot in there. So you have these two characters. You have Noah and you have Lot, and he gives you a description of both. Here's the suddenness, verse 29. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Now, brothers and sisters, I have my own little take on this. Uh, the same day, the day of the rapture, uh, hopefully it's tonight, tomorrow, soon. But when it happens, based on what I'm reading here, I, I have this thought that on that same day, the panic and the chaos that's going to confront the world might trigger a nuclear exchange. Now think about that. Look at what the verse says. Look at it carefully. Verse 29. But the same day, what day? Well, the day that Lot got out of Sodom with his wife, his daughters. The same day Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven. That could be a nuclear exchange. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed them all. What if the day we leave and there's going to be millions of Americans born again that are going to go up to meet the Lord in the air. And I don't know how many Russians. I mean, I, I'm not, certainly not like in the United States at all. But could that trigger some sort of chaotic situation, some sort of emergency switch where there is a nuclear exchange and Russian submarines fire their missiles and we fire missiles at Russia or China for that matter? You know, like I look at that verse and I kind of say, yeah, the Lord might be timing this coincidentally. We leave and disaster hits. But until then, what? Business as usual. Partying, drinking, eating. Remember Belshazzar's feast? Ha, ha, ha. They're drinking out of the cups and stuff that they stole from the temple. And then all of a sudden, what? The handwriting goes on the wall. Amen? You're finished tonight. You're finished. So, are you ready? After you heard that, are you ready? I hope so. Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles, Psalm 138. Uh, let's look at verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Brothers and sisters, if there's any verse in the Bible that the Jesuits hate, and I went to Jesuit school, it's that verse, the second part. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Had no problem with the name. In fact, as a Catholic, when I went into Catholic Church on Sundays, other days, and you mentioned the name of Jesus, you bowed your head in reverence to that holy name. But the word, well, that's a different story. That's a much different story. Now, not long ago, I was sad when I heard the news that Brother Jack Chick had gone home. I, I, I was happy that he was with the Lord. Sad in the sense that he can never be replaced. This man was a giant. This man was a giant. Uh, Christians in America know of him or should know of him. He did more to promote the spreading of the word of God than any other living man in the last 50 years in, in, in the world. Not just America, in the world. And you talk about a man that was hated by the Jesuits. Oh, did they hate this man? If they could have gotten away with killing him, and I'm sure they might have tried on occasion uh, or, or tried to think of ways to put him away, this man bothered them like you have no idea. He, back in the, I think it was the 80s, around 82, 83, he had written a tract, our, uh, he did a booklet on Our Roman Catholics Christians. Man, oh man. That, <laughs> I gave that to some Catholics. They went ballistic. They went nuclear when they read it. Uh, you couldn't argue against it because it was truthful. It was factual. But they couldn't handle it. Catholics can't handle the truth. And Jack Chick was their nemesis. Now, there are rumors that uh, Father Alberto Rivera, who claimed to be a Jesuit, 
uh, and he, they claim he, according to his widow, uh, there might have been a, a Jesuit attempt to poison him, or in fact, he might have been poisoned. He died kind of early, and under a little bit of mysterious circumstances. And I know the Jesuits weren't thrilled with Father Alberto Rivera because he revealed a lot about them that they didn't want revealed. And uh, Jack Chick, at the time, uh, did a thing, uh, some comics on uh, Alberto. And uh, one of his staff had called me to uh, talk to me about the, the Jesuits and the legitimacy of Father Alberto. Well, I, I couldn't vouch for Father Alberto. I didn't know him. But I said, certainly some of the things he's bringing out are true. There's no question about it. And the man is in danger. The man is in danger. The, the Jesuits have a, a, a list of people, a, a, and in history, that they hate, that, that have caused them more damage. For instance, did you know, on that list, besides Martin Luther, is uh, Otto von Bismarck, the German chancellor. And when he took over, when he took power in Germany, boy, he gave the Germans a heck of a time. And he, he really was a problem for them. That was uh, and the great Russian author Dostoevsky, believe it or not, when he had wrote his famous work, The Brothers Karamazov, and he had that part in there that dealt with the uh, the Roman priests and the cardinals, uh, who he said would turn on Jesus Christ viciously, just the way the Jewish leadership did when Jesus was alive on earth, and boy, they never forgot that. And who else is on the what I call the Jesuit Hall of Fame list? Oliver Cromwell. <laughs> He, he had uh, King Charles I beheaded. <laughs> he did, and besides King James, it was Oliver Cromwell, one of the the worst people according to the Jesuits. And why am I saying this? The, the Jesuits were out to destroy the King James Bible from the moment it was published. Uh, before then, with the gunpowder plot, they tried to destroy the Parliament and take King James out. And this was to stop the work because King James had called for that work in 1605. He had taken over in 1604. Elizabeth died, and, and James took over the crown. And in 1605, at Hampton Court, he called for all the scholars to assemble, the greatest minds in England, to produce a translation uh, that would improve on the previous one, the, the Geneva Bible. And the Jesuits knew about it, and they were out to stop him. And they've been out to destroy that Bible ever since. This is their one main goal to undermine faith in the King James Bible. Now, what they worked on for the longest time, a lot of Christians don't know this. They don't know history. And when I came down here from the north, and I came down to this area in the Bible Belt and everything, and I began finding out how many Baptist pastors even were using counterfeit Bibles, modern translations, I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. I said, how could this be? How could how easily they were fooled by the Jesuits and duped into using counterfeit Bibles, all with that same stupid rationale, well, we got to have modern versions, something easier to read, and after all, the King James is archaic. I says, look at these poor idiots. They're in the pulpit. They, they, they swallowed the Jesuit propaganda hook, line, and sinker. I says, dear Lord, I know these men love you and they preach the gospel. God bless them, but uh, they're kind of dumb. Uh, unfortunately, and they're leading their people astray, putting these modern Bibles in their hands. Now, what the Jesuits tried to do from the very beginning was to destroy faith in the Word of God. Now, before Westcott and Hort got their revised version out in 1881, the first rewrite of the King James Bible was published. That's the so-called revised version of 1881. But Few people know that earlier on in 1870, the Jesuits had called for a Vatican Council. Vatican I, it was called. Like Pope John had Vatican II back in the 60s. This was Vatican I, and it was called around late 1869. They started meeting in 1870. This was under the direction of the Jesuits. The idea behind this council was to claim that when the Pope of Rome taught on morals and doctrine, he was infallible. This is the council that declared papal infallibility. Why was that? The Jesuits were trying to get people away from looking to the word of God and looking to a man. 
to teach and declare himself infallible. This was done 10, 11 years before Westcott and Hort got the RV published by virtue of the Jesuits. So the Jesuits were already working on this. How can we undermine faith in God's word? How can we divorce people from faith in the word and put their eyes on man? That's what that council was all about. Now, this doctrine of infallibility, this is such a joke. Uh, For instance, uh, Pope Pius XII taught in 1950 that the Virgin Mary uh, bodily ascended into heaven upon her death. It's called the Feast of the Assumption, and the Catholic Church has that day on August the 15th of each year. It is a holy day of obligation, and each Catholic is required to attend Mass on that day under pain of mortal sin. You see, I was Catholic. I taught this stuff, okay? And I I, I lived under that fear and that guilt. You better go to Mass. It's in the middle of the summer, but that's the day that Mary's body rose up into heaven, incorruptible. Nothing happened to her corpse. It just miraculously rose up into heaven. Why? Because Pius XII had a dream and said he saw it in his dream and everybody declared his teaching infallible. The bishops were told it's an infallible teaching of the church. Most people don't know this. Okay, it's a joke. Now, you got this Immaculate Conception. That's on November, December the 8th. On December the 8th, the Catholic Church celebrates what they call the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. That's another holy day of obligation, and you've got to show up at Mass if you're a Catholic, or you commit mortal sin. Now, what is this? You ask the average Gentile, Christian, Protestant, Baptist, what is that? Is that the teaching that Mary was a virgin when she conceived Jesus Christ? Well, yes, we believe that, sure. Yeah. Yeah. The Catholics accept that. That's a, that's a biblical fundamental of the faith. Mary was a virgin. Jesus was born without sin. But the Immaculate Conception that the Catholic Church honors is that Mary herself was born sinless. Not that she immaculately conceived Jesus Christ, but that she herself was born sinless. The average Christian doesn't know that. They hear the term immaculate conception and think, well, the Catholic Church is honoring the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. No! No, they believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, but they teach that Mary herself was born without sin. So logically, you follow that out because she was sinless. She didn't see corruption when she died. You see? Now, the immaculate conception idea, that came around 1850-something. And a hundred years later, Pius XII declares that Mary's body floated up to heaven when she died. So it was a logical extension of their belief in the, <laughs> that Mary herself was born sinless, which is ridiculous because when you read Luke's gospel, you see that Mary called God her Savior. You wouldn't need a Savior if you yourself were sinless. This is all nutty. And uh, by the way, the the church stretches it out, too, with the so-called perpetual virginity of Mary. Uh, As long as they're going to say she was born sinless, then they they have to have in there somewhere the idea that Joseph couldn't touch her. This is a sinless, pure woman. This is a woman that's going to live with a man and yet never be touched because she's immaculate. And when she dies, Pius is going to come along and decide that she floated up into heaven and her corpse never saw corruption. Oh, by the way, the church even used to tell me, I remember learning this in Jesuit school, that she died in Ephesus, Turkey. She was in Ephesus among the Ephesians when she died. Did you know that one? That's a kind of secret. You know, when I look back on my days... (laughs) Catholic Church, and I think of all the propaganda and superstition and baloney that was pumped into me, I just, thank God I got saved. It's a miracle. Salvation's a miracle. But what grieves me is so many Christians are so uninformed about this, and especially when it comes to the Bibles, and they they all jumped on Jack Chick when he wrote that, uh, the attack, that booklet on the attack on the King James Bible, he took a solid stand for the purity of the King James Bible. And Christians railed against them. Christians railed against them. Uh, Why? Because he hurt the sales of the modern versions. He was hurting their sales. 
And, and I look around and I say, how, many, how, how could it be God's people could be so dumb as to get these modern Bibles and believe that these modern Bibles are an improvement on the King James? Well, obviously, they don't believe God's word, that he was able to keep his word pure. They don't believe it. Or they have some sort of problem with reading a, a book that came out in the, in the 16th century, uh, I'm sorry, the 17th century, and it, it talks about thee and thou, and it has TH endings. What's hard about that? He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. So what? You want to put a TH ending on a verb? Does, is that going to confuse me or something? What's the matter with people? So they swallowed the Jesuit line, and now they got the infallible teaching uh, that Mary herself did not see corruption. Isn't that a winner? So work commenced at Westminster on June the 22nd, 1870, is when Westcott and Hort, uh, are using the Codex Vaticanus, the Vatican manuscript, which, by the way, has the Greek that's used in the Codex Vaticanus is classical Greek. It's, it's not conversational Greek. So why they would use that corrupt manuscript, God only knows. It's the devil that led him to do that. The, the Vaticanus manuscript. You know, in Jesuit school, they have you read Greek. They, they teach you Greek. Do you know that? And, and they lift up the teachings of Aristotle and Plato. Isn't that unbelievable? Aristotle and Plato. It's just so sad. And I think back and I think all the philosophy that they taught us and the uh, emphasis on man's thinking and rational thinking and logic. Imagine that. They were already starting to subvert the minds of these young men, like myself, into thinking that man can put something together that you could believe. Salvation is a miracle. It's, it has to be an act of God that convinces you that God alone can give you wisdom. And whatever wisdom you get down here apart from the Lord Jesus Christ is earthly and it doesn't amount to a hill of beans. He confounds the wisdom of the wise. He sets at naught all their counsel. Just think of all the power that was behind Hillary trying to become the president of the United States. All the, the money she outspent Donald Trump 10 to 1. It was unbelievable. There were, the odds on her, Donald Trump had 10% chance of winning, according to the New York Times. And they woke up the next day crying. How could this have happened? Well, look up. One Christian said, Brother Militello, I... I I can't believe it. I, this Christian voted for Clinton, believe, believe it or not. I says, what can't you believe? Well, she was supposed to win. I says, and what happened? You're disappointed? Well, she was supposed to win. I said, let me tell you something. I'll just give you the scriptural answer, and you could sleep on that for the next hundred years. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You got it? Before I became a Christian and I was at the racetrack many a time and heard a lot of things about horses that were supposed to win and had people whispering in my ear, I was just by the barns. This horse is a lock. He can't miss. I said, who told you? The trainer himself. Oh, boy, I better get a bet down. This. I heard so many stories about horses that couldn't miss. Believe me, after that, I became the most skeptical person in the world. <laughs> Somebody said, is it an upset? I said, in my lifetime, I have never seen a greater upset than Donald Trump beating Hillary Clinton, honestly. But there were two other things that I shall remember in my lifetime that were great upsets. One was, and I wasn't saved then, in January 1969, when Joe Namath predicted that the New York Jets would beat the Baltimore Colts in the Super Bowl, and the Colts were 17-point underdog. And I, I remember that, that, I watched it on TV, I, I said to my cousin, you know, the Jets are going to beat them. Jets are going to, it was a huge upset. And the other one I remember, and this is in my unsaved days back in New York, was 1969. 1969, the New York Mets were a 100-to-1 underdog to win the National League pennant, and they won. The year before, they lost almost 100 games. I mean, they were a joke. Somehow, they won. They won the pennant. Then they faced Baltimore in the World Series, and they were a heavy underdog to lose to the Baltimore Orioles. And what happened? The New York Mets won in five games. 
they beat the Orioles. So I've been around to see things happen that weren't supposed to happen. So when I found out, when I'm watching the TV the other night, election night, and I see the results coming in, and I say, wow, Donald Trump is going to win. He's going to be the next president of the United States. It didn't shock me. It was just like the Lord has a way of surprising people. Hey, how many Christians are going to be surprised at the judgment seat of Christ when they find out their service to the Lord didn't amount to a hill of beans? That's something you should worry about. That's a surprise you don't want to face, okay? Think about that. Amen? Amen.